Hello and welcome to Tao Capes, the podcast that covers film, television, comics, and games. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Hill. What's up, guys? Uh, the video version of today's episode is available on YouTube. If you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your plot, uh, podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Today we're talking about the Marvels. Mm. Carol Danvers, a.k.a. Captain Marvel, has reclaimed her identity from the tyrannical Kree and taken revenge on the supreme intelligence. However, unintended consequences see her shouldering the burden of a destabilized universe. When her duties send her to an anomalous wormhole linked to a Kree revolutionary, her powers become entangled with two other superheroes to form the Marvels. The Marvels was released on November 10th, 2023, on a budget of $270 million. Man, that's up there. It is. It is made between forty-seven to $55 million at the time of recording. If those numbers hold true based on the reports I'm seeing, that will make it the lowest MCU uh, box office performance ever. Uh, it has a Rotten Tomato score of 62% and an audience score of 85%. Obviously, all these numbers are at the time of recording. So let's talk non-spoilers. So, Todd, do you recommend people watch the Marvels, and why or why not? I would have to say no. Because you hate women. No. To bring, <laughs> okay. So tell us why or why not, or why in this case. Uh, for me, and again, this is just my personal opinion, I think this may actually be the worst MCU movie ever put to film. Oof. Oof, that's saying a lot. And that's including the Eternals, which I have yet to make it all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> so worse than Eternals, worse than Iron Man 2, worse than Thor, The Dark World. I all don't those. watch any of them over this one. I don't know, folks. It just did not resonate with me at all. I mean, maybe some parts and some plot threads, but other than that, it missed its mark with me. And that's just me, but... I can say safely no, 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 no. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, we'll get into it later, but, I mean, the, we don't look at these films, we don't go into them and be like, oh, three female leads, give me a break. Like, right. it's not, I, I could care less about the leads of the film. F female, male, it doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. It's about quality. You know, it's about quality of the storytelling. It's about characters, about story. And I, I can't recommend people watch the Marvels. Um, if you enjoyed Love and Thunder, if you enjoyed Ant Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, maybe if you enjoyed Miss Marvel on Disney Plus, then you might enjoy the Marvels. I didn't enjoy Love and Thunder, not as much as Ragnarok by far. Um, Quantum Mania couldn't be bothered. <laughs> Could not be bothered based on the word of mouth. Miss um, Marvel, I didn't even watch, but I've heard we've talked about it. You watched Miss Marvel. I actually did watch it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you thought I think thought it was fine. I thought it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you enjoy those three things of recent MCU history, I think you might enjoy the Marvels. I personally did not enjoy the film at all. Uh, the first half of the film was it was forgettable, but it was fine. And then once we hit a certain scene, I was done. <laughs> I was done with the film, and that makes me say, save your money, catch it on Disney+, Plus. Yeah, if I'm honest. If you watch it there, I mean. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so that's it for non-spoilers, spoilers from here on out. Uh, before we discuss the film in detail, it's time to play another round of How Many Stars, Todd. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's the uh, highest uh, and most well-performing game in Istanbul. Did you know that? I did not know that. Okay. Well. Hey, thank you, Istanbul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have five audience reviews for the Marvels here, Todd. I will read your review, and you tell me from one to five how many stars you think the person gave the film. Again, no half-star reviews. Not trying to trick you. So DH says, flirkin', 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 fast-paced fun movie. How many stars? I think he gave it four. Give it five stars. Uh... Afro Saiyan says, Jesus, this was a mess. Kamala shined, and Monica was really great, was she felt underutilized. She plot was kind of generic. Carol makes bad decisions, laughing emoji. The villain is Ronan 2.0, and WTF did they do to Fury. Still hate that cat. The editing is bad, and it felt like Thor, Love and Thunder, but worse with how disjointed it was. Could have made it season two of Miss Marvel, to be honest. How many stars? Got to be a one. It's a two star. Oh, yeah, man, that I surprised am, me as I well. I'm stinking it up right now. 
Bill says, and he puts in pluses and minuses here for positive and negative. So positive, good chemistry between between actors. Negative, disjointed story. Negative, needed to have watched Disney to understand other characters. Negative, obviously semi-sequel in the works with younger actors. But who is the archer? Back to Disney? Question mark. How many stars? <laughs> Two. Two stars. Hey, I'm on the board. Nice. Sci Teach 3 says, I am shocked in how unbelievably bad this movie was. I've seen every Marvel film and TV show, and I almost felt like this was a parody of Marvel. Seems like they wanted to capture the fun, craziness of Thor Ragnarok, but it failed miserably. Really thought of walking out a couple times. How many stars? That's got to be the one. That is the one star. Ah. All right. And finally here, Ian B. says, Great highs, but unfortunately some weird and misplaced lows. Miss Marvel is the heart and glue for this movie. How many stars? Three. Three stars. Oh. Yep, three stars. That's it, pal. Good job. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So now let's talk about the Marvels. Uh, so to kind of begin with, the Marvels, uh, it does address the ending of Captain Marvel. that kind of left some things open. Captain Marvel ended with Carol uh, vowing to deal with the Kree. The Marvels revealed that Carol made good on her promise to yon Rog by tracking down the Supreme Intelligence AI and destroying it once and for all. That little flashback, pretty decent. It was. I liked how it looked. She had the helmet on. I'm all for characters that have helmets in the comics. To wear them. To wear them. <laughs> yeah. Unlike Chris uh, Chris Hemsworth in the Thor movies, uh, we see Star-Lord wear his He wears fairly, his quite a bit. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, she looks good with the helmet. Uh, with that said, Todd, walk us through the opening of the film. So after the destruction of the Supreme Intelligence, uh, like you said, it kind of causes a Kree civil war. Uh, it has major consequences for their home world of Hala, uh, barely breathable air, uh, loss of sunlight and water. Uh, we're introduced to Dar Bin, uh, that's the new Kree leader. Uh, she actually manages to locate one of the two quantum bands. Uh, the other actually is the one that Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, possesses. Uh, she pairs the power of the band with her staff, which is, I think we learned, is called the universal weapon. Mm -hmm. And that gives her the ability to tear open what they call jump points in space. Uh, the anomalies are kind of picked up by the agency called SWORD. Uh, we see Nick Fury is back. He's aboard the Sabre space station. He's kind of in the middle of like a Cree skull peace talk. Uh, but he calls in Danvers and Rambo to kind of investigate those anomalies that are happening near the station. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Let's stop and talk about Samuel L. Jackson and Fury for a second. What did, what did they do to my guy Nick Fury in this film, Todd? Uh, he's kind of reduced to a, a comic relief, almost uh, fuzzy, feely grandpa type version of his older self here. Yeah, I mean, he's like, uh, I, I watched bits and pieces of Secret Invasion. Um, and obviously in that film, he's playing like, or not film, but show, He's, like, a broken down, like, he's disillusioned. He's not very happy-go-lucky. And, again, I didn't watch the entirety of Secret Invasion because mm -hmm. if you've seen it, you understand why I couldn't watch all of it. I didn't even watch it. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, like, this, this, you know, it's a point I have later, but this film doesn't acknowledge Secret Invasion at all, which leads it to the question of, like, what was the point of Secret Invasion? Right. If you're not going to reference it at all, especially when you have a film about uh, you know, that has the scroll as a focus. It's not the major focus, but, but it, they there, are there. Yeah. Uh, but then the character development and stuff that you do give Fury in Secret Invasion is just kind of wiped away here. And now he's just kind of happy-go-lucky. And he's in every scene he's in, he does nothing uh, of substance. It's all just about being there for comic relief. Pretty much. That's yeah. all it is. I mean, he does nothing substantial. He has one kind of semi-action scene when the heroes are kind of switching places back and forth, and he's in the the saber, I guess it's like the sky elevator. Is that what they call it? I think that was it. Yeah. And, but and it's like he he's kind of like you know shooting inside that that elevator, and he has a little action scene there. But like it's it's nothing outside of that is of any substantial like impact at all. He's just there to make crack little jokes and be a side character. I mean, he's always been a side character, but now he's just reduced to, like, the comic sidekick. Yeah. <laughs> and it just, I hated it. It did not work. It like, did not work Give him at some all. gravity in some points. If you want to have him there, I mean, obviously Samuel L. Jackson can be a funny guy and have a, a comedic tone to him and, and, and how he sounds in some of his actions. But, like, 
he's got to have some gravity to him. Like, yeah. but in this, no, it's just cracking jokes, being the comic, you know, sidekick, the relief character, and that's every scene he's in in this film. And I, I just could not stand it. It just really put me off from the get go with any scene he was in. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not his fault. It's the material. It's what he had to work it's with. It's the story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so going forward from what you were saying, obviously they were uh, in, you know, kind of investigating those jump points through space. Uh, so Monica Rambo, she kind of touches it. Uh, and then she Danvers and Kamala Khan, they switch place through teleportation. Uh, the switches, uh, the switching causes the three to kind of fight each other's Cree enemies. I think they're like, um, you know, in Kamala's house and those kind of stuff. That was action scene was, it was fine. Yeah. It wasn't bad. It wasn't great. It was, it was fine. Um, you know, it kind of destroys, you know, Kamala's house and then kind of the wake of it. But again, it was a fine action scene. Like the first half of this movie, I was okay with it. Like yeah. I wasn't super, there was not a super high and there wasn't super lows of it. It was just fine. It was even, I was like, okay, this, this could get better. Like this, you know, there could be some room to kind of grow here right. in that first half. So I was still on board at this point. Um, but we get the three women. They return to their original places. Fury and Rambo kind of visit Kamala Khan on Earth. She kind of, she's a Captain Marvel fangirl. She's just completely enamored oh, yeah. with Carol Danver, uh, Danvers' Captain Marvel. Uh, so she kind of eagerly, like, demonstrates her powers to her, ends up switching places with her, like, those kind of things. So when she flies away, uh, she ends up switching with Kamala, like, midair. And, you know, you just kind of see, like, a bunch of their, you know, they kind of surmise that their powers have been kind of, like, entangled. That's what they call it, I think, quantum entanglement, and that they switch pa uh, places when they use their powers. So that was something in this, like, here's here's a question for you. So they, they figure out they can switch places when they use their powers, right? So, like, they they, they, they all, the Rambo and Danvers touch the, the jump point. It entangles them with Kamala because she also shares that kind of same power as they do. So they all learn that they can switch places when they use their powers, which they only seem to switch places when they use their powers in a certain way. Yeah, it was kind of odd. I didn't know what the, the parameters was it for. There's like a little throwaway line. I couldn't tell you exactly what said, but it was like almost like the way Carol Danvers made it look in one scene, it was like, if I use my right hand versus my left hand or something, kind of like, it was like, it was just a weird, that wasn't the line, but she's shown using one hand and it like switching her and then she uses the other and it's like different. And there's a little line I think Monica Rambo has about what part of their power set does yeah. it, but it like, it, again, it's not really explained very well and it's like, they only seem to switch places when it's convenient for the story right. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but as a big plot point in the film, you know, them switching places using their powers, um, did you think they did anything interesting with them being able to switch places? There's nothing that I can remember right offhand, and we just saw it just, you know, a couple of days ago that stands out in any way. Like, there could have been, like, you know, something cool where, like, one of them comes in, uses her attack, the other one gets brought in, uses her attack, the other one gets brought in, uses her attack, you know, kind of piling on an attack for a cool scene. Right. Am I rambling? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I think but you're I, right. Yeah, nothing memorable, memorable is done with being able to drag and drop in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially in the in the final fight, like I was expecting a lot more of that. Because, like, there's a scene earlier and they're kind of, you see them practicing switching places on their ship, and I'm like, okay. And, you know, they're jumping rope and they're juggling and switching places. And Bouncing back and books forth. on their head. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm like, they're doing all this. But I was thinking, I'm like, how, do, how much does that help me in a fight, for one? But it, it's all well and good when you can see each other and know exactly what the other person is doing. And, like, you know when you switch places, all right, I'm going to need to catch the ball. Or I'm going to be balancing the book. Or I'm going to be doing this. But when you're switching back and forth during the fight, that's all out the window. Yeah. You, you don't know. You can't choreograph that. Yeah, you don't know where, where Carol is in her fight. You don't know where Monica is doing in her fight. You don't know where Kamala is, what they're doing. Are they being shot at? Are they being the aggressor? Like, you don't know any of that. So all that kind of training does seems kind of pointless in a way because unless I'm directly staring at you and I know when we switch places, you're going to be sitting here doing the same thing, yeah. then it's well and good. But if I, I know, I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're in a fight. You could be about to get stabbed as soon as I get in. It's like, oh. Now I'm stabbed. Now I'm stabbed. <laughs> exactly. So, like, I, it just, I guess it was a way to show that they were understanding what was going on, but, like, as a practical matter in the film, like, it wasn't really used in any, any kind of interesting way. I expected it to be in the final fight, 
And, like, if that fight is five minutes, maybe for 60 seconds they may do some, like, switching places. Yeah. But it's never, like, a big kind of – it's never built up to. It's never, like, emphasized like you're talking about. Yeah, it's something cool that was way underutilized, I think. Yeah, exactly. I think it's a good premise. But, yeah, like you said, underutilized. It, it just kind of – He's kind of forgotten about in the second half of the movie. Like the first movie, the the first part of the movie is like that's the the heavy focus, figuring out what's going on, what is going on with us. Let's try to use it to our advantage. And then it's kind of like once they do figure out how to use it, or you know, supposedly, it's kind of forgotten about through the rest of the movie. Yeah, pretty much. Um. So the three of them end up uh, at a squ- uh, scroll refugee colony on a planet called Tarnax. So pick us up from there, Todd. Uh, so basically, Darbin has uh, opened another jump point. Uh, she plans to steal the atmosphere of this planet, Tarmax or Tarnax. I'm sorry, <laughs> Tarmax. <laughs> yeah, get the tar off your Get car. the tar off your car, With folks. Tarmax. Todd speaking, no good. Uh, <laughs> Tarnax. Okay. Uh, she's wanting to take their atmosphere to, of course, take it back to Hala to restore theirs. Uh, our heroes are now trying to uh, rescue the colony. Uh, They've been dubbed the Marvels by Kamala. You know? Yeah, so they're they're like on Tarnax. They're like working with, I guess, the scroll. It's the scrolls, yeah. Emperor. I can't Maybe. remember his title yeah. um, of, of what, what he's supposedly supposed to be. But they're, you know, again, a pretty decent scene of them rescuing, uh, trying to rescue the scrolls, get them on the evacuation ships. There's like the, that pull, that jump point kind of sucking in some of the escape ships. Uh, it's a pretty decent it action was, scene. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a little bit of drama when they can't save everybody. And, you know, Kamala's kind of like, you know, oh, there's all these people. And Kara's like, we got to go. Like, shut the doors. We got to go. Yeah. And there's like a little bit of drama there where, like, you know, you see kind of a little bit of heartbreak on Kamala's face where it's like you can't save everybody kind of thing. Yeah. And then the next scene after that is just like takes all the air out of it. It goes af- from that to like you know, Monica and Carol's kind of backstory. Like, why'd you leave? Well, I left because of this. And I didn't think I could come home because I suck. (laughs) You know, like that was like the next scene. And I'm like, I don't know. You just kind of felt like you, you wasted a good story point with character development for some of the stuff we don't really care about. And Monica just, I don't know. Again, for me, Monica just seemed like a (laughs) crybaby. She's off like trying to save, like, and make it up to the Cree and do all this. Like you're as an adult, you know, What's going on? You right. know, Carol Danvers is Miss Marvel, and she's out there, or Captain Marvel, and she's out there trying to do all this stuff, and she fought Thanos and all this, and you're like, why didn't you come home when I was six? <laughs> I hate you. Like, you know, right. just, it's a wasted good story opportunity to develop Kamala and, and, and kind of go from that off of the back of them not being able to save all the scrolls, and it's just, like, completely washed away to, like, let's address this this backstory that no one really cares about and seems a little whiny, in my opinion. But that's gotcha. just me. Because gotcha. I hate women. <laughs> Wait! <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so continue, Todd. Sorry. Uh, so we get a little cameo from uh, Tessa Thompson as Valkyrie. Uh, she Wearing kinda her sh- best Sunday three-piece. Yeah, in a nice three-piece business yeah, suit. She's uh, not in her armory thing. She's just in there like, I, I mean, I guess she is the leader of Asgard now. I she's guess nine she- to five in it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so she basically shows up to take the scrolls back to a new Asgard to give them a place to stay. Uh, and let me get back to my point here. Um, I think at that point is where uh, we kind of see after Valkyrie kind of takes uh, all the scrolls off the ship. It's about kind of get a little backstory about yeah. how the quantum bands work. I apologize. No, you're fine. <laughs> and how the jump points can cause uh, you do, are actually destroying the fabric of our universe. They're creating havoc. And- yeah, exactly. Like that 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 energy uh, that Darban is kind of using to like disrupt it. It's like causing like instability in like the network and basically putting the whole universe in danger. Basically, right, is right. where we're at. Uh, so after she siphons the air from Tarnax to Hala, uh, they figure out that Darban wants to draw water to Hala. So they uh, Captain Marvel figures that the best place to do that is a planet called. Aladna. I think that's right. Aladna. Aladna. It reminded me because when they said it, I was like, Aladdin? (laughs) Aladna. Okay. Um, So they go to Aladna, and this is where, again, up until this point, I'm like, okay, the Marvels, all right, it's fine. It's forgettable, but it's it's fine. But then they get to Aladna, and tell us what happens when the Marvels arrive on Aladna time. 
So uh, basically, like you said, they're, they're going to Aladna to stop Darbin from stealing their water. And I'm pretty sure right before that, Carol mentions how a large portion or significant portion of this planet is covered in water. 96.3% yeah, or something like that. Yeah. So I'm expecting you like at the least like an aquatic type setting, possibly like an underwater scene. Mm-hmm. But uh, we get there and it's like an enchanted land of people. Mm-hmm. And the only way they can speak is through song. Mm-hmm. And they all start singing. And uh, we find out that uh, Carol Dammers is actually their princess. Yeah. How she married their prince. Yeah, she makes an offhand comment before they land about how she had to help out a prince with something. And we come to find out that I guess... Part of that was she married the prince. I believe so, But yes. they land on this planet, and they're greeted by all these people, and, they, and this, this little girl just comes up and just starts singing like it's a Disney movie, which it is technically, yeah. but like it's just so off-putting to me and out of place, and they're like, oh... This, you know, this world, they only can communicate through song. And then if you don't sing what you say, they're probably not going to understand you, except for the prince who speaks not perfect English, but can he under- can, speak, he can yeah. speak and under and, and, and converse with them without singing. And it is it is awful. They, they go to a little ball or a party, and Carol switches to like a Captain Marvel esque ball game. It's like more, it's a Captain Marvel. It's got her symbol on the yeah, chest. Yeah, it's a still. Captain Marvel themed dress. He's like, would you want to dance or something? It's like a, a ballroom dancing scene. They dance and sing, and it's like I don't know. Is it like, is this like some kind of wish fulfillment stuff for the audience? I mean, obviously it is a, it's a female led, uh, you know, film. Is this like supposed to be wish fulfillment for? Young girls or girls of any age. I mean, I'm a 33 year old man. This is probably a topic <laughs> outside of my depth of field. But like, who is it for? Is it for kids? Let me help you here, Cody. Uh, this is Disney uh, owning all these properties and mishandling them at their leisure. And now they've got the Mickey Mouse size balls or larger to think they can <laughs> Disney eyes a scene in an actual Marvel movie. Yeah, and I know we've dipped into the silliness in some of these films too varying levels of effectiveness you know thor ragnarok i think ran that line perfectly love and thunder stepped over way it over into the wrong way and went too much into it and this film just says i'll see your thor love and thunder <laughs> and i'll raise in. you yeah <laughs> i'll raise you this planet that only sings via song and captain marvel's married to a prince and all this stuff and i mean maybe some people can look past it and just say it's a fun little scene, but I don't know. For me, I'm I, maybe I'm too cynical about these things, or maybe I take them too seriously. But like I just, you can have fun and levity and stuff in 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 superhero films. Like Marvel's don't. That's what they've made their bread and butter on. Marvel makes the joke before the audience can. Like, hey, look at these six dudes in tights. Like, hey, right. like you know, like that's been the the joke the whole time. Is like let's we'll make fun of it and we'll be the first to make the joke, but then also introduce, you know, the serious side of the characters and serious things and stakes and stuff like that. And this is just, I don't know. Maybe, again, maybe I'm not the audience for this, but, um, you know, as a person that paid money to see it, hated it. Yeah, this just, uh, it took you completely out of whatever you may or may not have been enjoying from the first part of this movie. Yeah, it, feels it like, did me anyway. Yeah, it feels like you've just stepped into an entirely different film. A Disney movie. Yeah, a real like a real like a like it's like a musical version of the Marvels. Maybe that's the point. I mean, I, I get it's like kind of a probably a Bollywood kind of reference to like Bollywood films and things like that. I get all that, but like, you know, it just feels like you're stepping into an entirely different film for about ten minutes and then they're like, I oh, just forget about that. Let's get back yeah. to our story. Now back to the story. Already in progress. Already in progress. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just like, no, you can't do that. Like I'm all I mean, we were literally sitting there and we were just like laughing. I started laughing i couldn't yeah. help it and i apologize yeah, some of y'all like, enjoyed it but i i cackled yeah I cackled exactly. hard. and then there's another <laughs> there's another little scene so like when they figure out um darbin is kind of open a jump point darbin the and her have arrived yeah, yeah the career are arriving and they're like how do we announce this uh so uh their uh, early warning system of any kind of i guess trouble or attack is just somebody's up on a tower or a parapet like and they're a, like <laughs> that's how you know 
trouble is upon yeah, you. Yeah, there's like there's, there's like two people or something up on a balcony or something, and like you said, they're just like, oh. Did you folks think I could hit that note? I did. Yeah, I know, right? Nice. <laughs> is that a falsetto there, Todd? Man. Yeah, it's just, oh, my God, it's horrible. And it's like, it just, it's, again, it's, just, it's out of place, and it's like, that's your early warning system? <laughs> two people... <laughs> Hollering up from a balcony. Yeah. Ah, just, I mean, how would you discern that from the other singing? I mean, honestly, yeah. if you think about it, hmm. is she singing a lot higher? Uh, is exactly. it a different pitch or tone? Is that John's regular I'm singing happy voice or is that well, his, about there's to get an fucked up. impending <laughs> danger voice? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, let's let's move on. Trucking about along. That. But yeah, this is like almost <laughs> the midpoint of the of the film, and this will that is the scene there if you're okay with it. Then that, if you're all right with that scene, you're you're, you're going to be fine with the rest of the movie. Exactly. If you if you if you if that scene evokes like a visceral rage inside of you, you're like done. it does us, you're done. <laughs> you're done. Uh, so Darbin, she tears open a jump point to get all the to draw the water, the ocean water into Hala. The Marvel, uh, the Marvels, and the people of uh, Aladna fight. Um, to kind of like they they fight against Darbin's forces. She's got like some kind of Tie Fighters. Basically, yeah. ships of her own. Some ships of her own. Yeah. Uh, the Marvels, you know, it's some back and forth with her, like you know, a little bit of power switching, but it's not used as like switching for, like for active combat. It's just it's just happening still because right. again, they did all this training, but they're still like just doing it at random. Yeah, exactly. Um, then they get into the ship and they're trying to kind of escape the incoming fire from you know again Darbin's kind of Tie Fighter esque kind of ships that are chasing them. Um, and you know, they're kind of having a hard time getting away. And Miss Marvel is like, she activates a jump port to, to kind of a uh, jump point to kind of teleport them away and kind of get them out of the, the action, get them out of the danger. Um, again, that fight scene, it's, decent. it's decent, yeah. I mean, the, the effects were, I mean, some of the effects have been really, really bad in some Marvel projects recently. I didn't see anything that I was like, Ew. Like, yeah, there was no cringy CGI. Yeah, there, the effects and stuff, I, I can say, were, were, were pretty pretty well done. Yeah. Um, but, like, again, it was not really a very memorable fight. Um, and, like, again, you did all this, like, you set up this training and understanding our powers. And, again, that's another way to kind of pay them off. Again, we fought Darbin on Aladna, and we weren't in sync. We got our asses kicked. And then that's another story point that you can use, like, oh, we're finally in the, the end fight. Now we're in sync. Now we're making a big deal of it. But they don't do that either. It's just like, okay, they did the training. Then they started fighting Darbin. They completely misused their powers. They switched randomly. They don't know what they're doing. And then the last fight, they don't really make a big deal about being in sync or doing anything at all. Yeah, and depending on how you felt or about the single palooza that we just went through, uh, <laughs> you needed a big set piece right there. You needed something to either cleanse your palate or, you know, get it moved forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there wasn't really any high drama because you, you kind of cut away from what happens on Aladna to, you know, them just on some desert planet that they jump away to. They jump out of the action. Aladna is just left to fend for itself, basically. Because, yeah. um, you know, Miss Marvel's like, hey, we're getting out of here. Or we're going to get destroyed. And, again, that's where you have that scene where you could have had a, a good story point before, uh, more of that backstory stuff, more of like, you know, you weren't around and this is what I was doing and all that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's, it's whatever, it's fine. But like, again, you just, you leave the set piece to go to another scene that really doesn't move the story forward and really doesn't give a whole lot more characterization that this film is, is, is severely lacking. But uh, anyway, uh, let's, uh, I guess at this point, kind of take us through the end in here, Todd. Uh, so we learn that uh, Darbin's uh, final plan or final phase of her plan is she's wanting to enter Earth's atmosphere to steal our sun. Uh, but before we get there, uh, we backtrack just a little bit and we go back to the uh, space station, Saber Space Station, and we start seeing these little, they uh, look to me like little human brains almost, little pods. Yeah. And Fury's having like scientists kind of test them out, see what it is, you know, run tests on them. They start showing up more and more all over the space station. Uh, come to find out, and uh, I'm sorry I don't remember the cat's name. I just call him Tentacle Cat. Yeah, I can't remember the cat's <laughs> name either. It's his kittens. I guess he or she or, you know, just Tentacle Cat uh, lays uh, little brainy-looking pods, and they've hatched kittens. And it's very Goose. Fort Goose. Goose. Uh, Goose has had kittens, several little kittens, all across this little space station, breaking out of these little pods. And it's very fortunate 
because a large multi-billion dollar space station in orbit doesn't have enough adequate spaceships to get all of its crew off of it. So mm. it's a good thing we had these little kitten babies because yeah. they're about to ingest, uh, you know, tentacleize and draw into their mouths. All just the space station employees, you know, not Nick Fury or Kamala's family, just right. you know, the, just the lessers. Right, exactly. And we're all going to ride down in one spacecraft with, you know, Nick Fury, uh, Kamala's mom and dad and her brother, and just a bunch of cats with, you know, human fur balls inside their gullets. Yeah, yeah, it's, again, all that's kind of played for, it's played for comedy. Obviously, with that premise, how could you not play it for comedy? But, like, it just doesn't work. Again. Oh, unless we forget, you know, while they're ingesting those humans, we get the, uh, the theme, or not more the theme, but one of the songs from the musical Cats. Uh, oh, memory. Memory. Yeah. All the Lord, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's like, and then there's like a little bit of an element of like, uh, uh, forgive the pun, but cat and mouse, because they're like yeah. hunting the space station crew because they're not on board with getting eaten by flurkin oh, at all. that's right. So it's like a little cat and mouse. Yeah, and it's just, it just, again, it just feels out of place. Maybe if I wasn't just coming off the back like two scenes earlier of the Singapalooza, as you called yeah, it. Yeah, it's too close to Singapalooza. Maybe I could have said, <laughs> okay, this is the big scene of levity, levity and silliness in this film. Maybe it could have gotten away with it. But coming off of that and then a couple scenes later into this, it just seems like, well, obviously we're, we're, we're out of real story points with weight to them now we're yeah. just gonna how can we feel time in this very short ass film anyway <laughs> that runs for an hour and 45 minutes because it could have should have been a disney plus show um how can we feel time oh let's say that the flurkin goose is on board saber and is, is hatching flurkin eggs everywhere and that's how we get them off sure Let's do it, Kevin. <laughs> like it's like this movie could maybe afford to have one of those, either Singapalooza or the Cats, but I mean both of it just it sinks it like a rock. <laughs> again, yeah. Again, once you're in this scene, you're still it, it either again if you if you went along with Singapalooza, we'll call this one Cat Scratch Fever. Yeah, if you if you're good <laughs> with Singapalooza and you enjoyed it, then you're probably going to enjoy Cat Scratch Fever. But again, if you hated Singapalooza and you got that rage deep inside of you. This only ignited that fire that ever much more. Yeah, you're fighting it real hard not to, to get up and walk out yeah, right now. Yeah, I honestly thought about it. I was going to lead over to it, like, should we just go? <laughs> like, I know it's only like 20 minutes left. We could have got something to eat that night a lot sooner. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so what else do we got going on here, Todd, after uh, the hijinks with Nick Fury and the flurkin eggs and evacuating Saber? Uh, where else do we find ourselves with the end of the film? Uh, let's see, I think that's where we get uh, Darby in and the Marvel's final big fight. Mm -hmm. uh, again, they're kind of just doing, you know, they're trying to do the drag and drop co-op fights, but it's not really working. Uh, they get the drop on her. Uh, they get the universal uh, weapon, and I think they get the gauntlet away from her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they, they knock her into a wall. Again, they, they kind of do use their powers a little bit, but it's not emphasized as much as you would think it should be or could have been. Uh, in a better film, and they kind of knock her into a wall, and I guess a piece of the wall, the, the ship falls, and it has like a, a spiked piece, a spiked edge to it that kind of like, you know, stabs into her stomach and kind of pins her darbin right. on the ground, and that's when they kind of wrestle the, the quantum band away from her, I guess. And I think Darbin's kind of paraphrasing. She's like, you know, well, all this stuff that Miss uh, not Miss Marvel, Carol Danvers has wreaked upon Hala, you know, she should be held accountable for all this, and Monica Rambo's like, hey, maybe she should. Yeah, maybe she's got a point. Maybe she's got a point. Maybe she's got the powers to go back, and maybe she can fix some of this stuff she's created. Yeah, so, like, you know, Monica kind of uh, bats around the idea that you have enough power. Like, there, she's trying to she's trying to steal the Earth's son to take it back to Hala, but Hala's son is just, I guess, dormant, for lack of a better term. With your power, Captain Marvel, you can actually, you have enough power to reignite their son and, you know, and light Hala again. So she's kind of, Captain Marvel talks to Darbin. She's like, hey, you know, I'll go light your fucking son up. <laughs> and for Hala, right? And then Darbin's like, yeah, for Hala. And then they lift the thing off over like, no. Nah, not for Hala. Fuck you. Yeah. And she pins Miss Marvel down under that hammer. Yeah, exactly. So, like, she pulls a double cross on them, and then she, uh, I guess, wrestles Kamala's band away from her. She's got both the quantum bands. 
she flies out into space because she's going to open, I guess, the the jump point to kind of uh, – she needs both bangles at this point or quantum bands because it's, she, she needs – that much level of power, I guess, to, to move the sun, to move the sun to holla. So she goes out there and she's floating back, and they're like, "No, don't do it, because you're gonna blow yourself up." And what happens? She, she, she blows herself. She blows herself up. <laughs> yeah. So that that that's how the 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 final big confrontation ends. The the villain gets what they want, but obviously it's too much power. They can't control it, and that's what ends up uh, being Darbin's downfall, basically, at that point. Um, so what else do we get from there? So at that point, she does open up the jump point a little bit, but basically the jump point at that point with the power is basically tore a hole in the fabric of like space-time. It's opened up basically where you can see into another reality. Right. So Monica's like, hey, I can fix this. I need you to, like, do um, – I need a little spirit bomb scene where I draw some power from you, like Goku, and I need some <laughs> of your power, Kamala. I need some of your power, uh, Carol, and I have I can have enough to like, close this rift. So, like, cool, they do it. Monica flies into the opening all the way through into the other reality, starts to close it. And the whole time I'm like, well, obviously she – how are you going to close it, like – can you just close it from the outside? Why well, you got to be inside of it? Cool. Right. But uh, whatever. She pulled it towards you, you would have thought. You would have thought, but apparently, no. She has to be inside of the, the closing uh, uh, jump point. And so they f- Captain Marvel figures out, oh, like you're, you're going to sacrifice yourself. Can't have that. She takes off, tries to save Monica, but it's too late. Monica closes the jump point, closes the tear in space time, and is now stuck in an alternate or another universe or another timeline, something of that effect. Um, and what's our last little, well, our last two scenes. We get the last scene before the final scene is Carol moves to Louisiana. Right, right. So she moves into uh, Monica's mother's house. Uh, you kind of pictured a lot in uh, the first Captain Marvel film. She comes back to Earth, I guess, to stay there as a f- full-time resident, I guess. And so now she feels like, she uh she she does go back i should mention that before uh i, I skipped over she does uh, after monica's sacrifice she does go back to hala she does ignite their son again hala now has a breathable atmosphere water and their son is back so she has kind of kept her promise to the kree she's restored their planet so now she feels like she's earned the right to return home. So that's when she moves back to Louisiana, starts eating crawfish and gumbo. <laughs> um, and um, you see kind of little scenes with her and Kamala. And, you know, she's just kind of, I'm looking after the place, you know, right. for Monica till she returns, yeah. basically. And then what's our final little scene there with, uh, with our little potential team up, Todd? Oh, so we cut to a little thing there, uh, kind of a darkened apartment and a, uh, you see uh, Kate Bishop from the Hawkeye Disney Plus series walk through the door, and Kamala's in her kind of old uh, Nick Fury from Phase One style, yeah, like, recruiting her. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she uh, uh, she asks Kate. She says, uh, uh, "She's like, did you think you were the only teenage superhero?" And Kate's like, "I'm 23," <laughs> which was a, which is a kind of a funny line. Yeah. I gotta give it that. Uh, and uh, Kamala says uh, she's putting a team together, and she wants Kate on it. And then she's like, you know, long pause. Please, like kind of thing, <laughs> and uh, Young Avengers confirmed, Todd. Yeah, we, baby, we, we've got it. Woo, boy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's our final scene of the actual film before the credits roll. Uh, we do have a mid credit scene here. So the mid credit scene, we see Monica wake up in a hospital bed, and she finds her mom, or she thinks she's her mom, staring back at her. She's initially overwhelmed with happiness, uh, but it's then the doctor walks in. And who's our doctor, Todd? Why, it's the Beast, still played, voiced by Kelsey Grammer. Yeah, played by Kelsey Grammer. He don't know what to do with those tall salad and scrambled <laughs> eggs, Todd. <laughs> Call Charles, he'll know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we see the pretty comic-accurate-looking Beast. This is not Kelsey Grammer in his X-Men Last Stand makeup and, and all that. It's a CGI version of Beast. Looked awesome. It looked really good. I gotta say, very, very comic accurate, very, uh, very good looking representation of Beast. I thought uh, he comes in. He can he confirms to Monica that she's in uh, a universe parallel to her own. Um, 
and then kind of leaves right after telling uh, Maria that uh, Charles is, is kind of waiting for an update on the situation. He refers to her as binary, and when she stands up, we see her comic accurate costume in all its glory. Uh, after she demands to know who Monica is, the Earth 616 hero simply responds, oh, shit. <laughs> and roll credits. Uh, there is no post credit scene. There's a post credit sound of a flirking meowing. Yeah. But uh, no need to say, uh, to hang around for a post credit scene. There's only the mid credit scene, the post credit. If you stay around, you'll just hear the, the flirking meow. And then your, your final uh, theater credits will roll. So, Todd, what were your initial thoughts after watching The Marvels? Uh, I was, well, I can't say I was disappointed because I didn't really have any heat going in. It was just, I felt, I felt bad. I felt, <laughs> I felt, <laughs> felt dirty. I felt dirty. No, <laughs> I, I just felt kind of underwhelmed. Uh, I, f I thought that there were some genuinely good things that could have come from this. Uh you know, the plot point of uh, Carol Denver's having to struggle with what she did to her race, uh, uh, you know, just almost destroying Hala, you know, the ramifications of that. Uh, the thing you touched on with uh, kind of Miss Marvel and Carol Danvers and Carol kind of being rough with her on that one planet, like, you know, hey, we got to go. Let them go. Yeah. You know, don't meet your heroes kind of thing. Yeah, yeah don't meet your heroes. <laughs> and it's like, you know, uh, this is what comes with growing up and living the superhero life is that you can't save everybody. Yeah. Good lesson, great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. All that kind of lesson stuff, we kind of gloss over that for Monica and Carol back and forth about why did you leave? Well, Which Monica should have been old enough to knew why by the end. Yeah, by the end. And then like to understand, it was just like kind of forced, um, what's the word I'm looking for, for forced drama for drama's sake, I guess, when the real story that you're trying to tell provided all the drama that you would have needed and the lessons to kind of grow Carol's character because uh, th that character needs some development yeah. from the first one to this. Because, I mean, she's just – she's got – She's got the problems of Superman without the characterization of Superman. Right. Like, she doesn't have the personality or anything of, like, a Superman. She's just met with that Superman problem, which is something the Quantum Band uh, kind of allows this movie to do because it kind of uh, uh, drains power from Captain Marvel. So that's, like, your way around the Superman problem. How do you how do you fight, a, a, you know, basically a god? Well, you take some of their power, depower right. them in some way. But anyway, continue. And I also thought uh, there was a missed opportunity at the end, you know, when she goes back to reignite their son. You don't really see anything but the sun reigniting, getting brighter, re reforming in a way, I guess. Right. Uh, I thought there was a chance to actually show her inside of that because uh, I'm pretty sure when Monica suggests she does that, Carol's kind of like, well, I've never used that much power before. You know, show her in there trying to reignite that sun, struggling with it, having difficulty doing it, but, you know, breaking through at the end and doing it. We didn't get any of nah, that. It's just a wide shot of her flying into it. That's yeah. It. Uh, one thing that bugged me, and I'm like, it's such a nitpick. It's a, it's a nitpick, and I'll admit it. But I'm like, when she reignites the sun and it starts to light holla, these people have been living in darkness for how long? And they're just like looking right at it. But I'm like, wouldn't you just be like squinting and be like, oh. You kind of be like, ah. But they're just like, mm, sunlight. Soak it in, I can baby. see perfectly. And I'm like, it's such a nitpick, I know. But it just, it bugs me. I'm like, you would kind of be squinting and your eyes would have to adjust. But maybe they're a race of people that don't have to have <laughs> adjustments to lighting scenarios, I guess, like we do. Yeah, and another thing, you know, when uh, we see them kind of powering up Monica to go out and close that rift, uh, Miss Marvel's got both quantum bands. She's yeah. wielding both quantum bands. At the end, she's back to this, the one she originally had. Where's that other quantum band? Yeah, what is the <laughs> point of her saying that, you know, she gets both quantum bands and, like, you know, Carol's like, are you sure you can handle this or something like that? And she's like, you know, these bands traveled the universe to find me. I was born for this kind yeah. of thing. And at the end, she's back to just wielding. Yeah, I was born to have this for five minutes. Here you go. <laughs> um, like I thought that was her, her development. Cause I mean, for, for what I understand, the something that this film does answer is about what that bangle is that the Miss Marvel show didn't answer. And now she's got both of them. That's another evolution of her character. But again, it seems like that at the end of it, they take it away from her or someone really dropped the ball on the continuity and like, mm, she had both bands? I don't know. Put the one on her. We know she had the one. We know she's at least supposed to have one. Put one on her See, arm. It doesn't make sense. Like, why does she have both? Why would she not 
she obviously can wield both. Why does she not have both? What is the? There's no story explanation for it. What will we have to find out in the Miss Marvel season two or another movie? Yeah. And why mm-hmm. she doesn't have the both bangles anymore? Stupid. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, you got anything else for initial thoughts? I mean, you know, uh, they did the best of what they had to work with here. Right. I mean, there's no, there's no bad actors or actresses in this film. Uh, they're doing the best they can with what they got, but what they got wasn't a hell of a lot, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, again, the cast is fine. I think you know, um, some 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 characters are completely uh, done injustice, done wrong by the the story. But yeah, I think you know, all the performances are good. I think, I still think Brie Larson may have not been the the best choice for Captain Marvel. Right. She is still a little too stoic. I guess she does come out of her, they, I think they try to bring her out of her shell in this film, but I think they try to do it too much too fast. Right, right. You know, with throwing her into this Disney Singapalooza stuff and like all these, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they kind of skip characterization for like, you know, comedy and everything else. And like, I don't know. Um I, it's been so long since I've seen the first Captain Marvel, but like you know, I just remember her being kind of stoic and like militaristic. Yeah, military. I mean, obviously she has she has a militaristic background and stuff, but like you know, just very kind of blank slate. And maybe that's just the the premise and the the way that story was was for, uh, you know formed and her interpretation of it, since she was kind of a blank slate with not remembering who she was, but like. I don't know. I feel like there's still something lacking with her characterization. She was kind of she come the, the first movie come around at a time where they just kind of shoved her right on in the end game, and she was just not kind of there to play the heavy at the end. Yeah, she's still lacking some characterization. Um, I didn't watch Miss Marvel, but like seems like everybody's kind of enjoying Kamala. She was a little annoying at places to me, <laughs> a little too much. But she is, you know, supposed to be a young a young girl and stuff like that, exuberant teenager. Yeah, exactly. So I can buy that within the story. But you know, I think everybody, like you said, was fine. Um, is, tell me something else that you liked about the film. Ah, uh, it was short. <laughs> I'm just that it, that it was an hour forty five. Yes. Ah. Uh, um, you know, I mean, not to get back on a negative Nancy, but, you know, you talk about the old trend that used to be with Marvel movies of, like, underdeveloped, underutilized villains. Uh, villain Darby of the and, Week. Yeah. I mean, could it be possibly the weakest one we've had? I don't know. Yeah, next to Mads Mikkelsen's, I forget his, his character in Doctor Strange, is probably one of those right at the bottom tier of, like, forgettable and Villain of the Week stuff. Yeah. For sure. Um, anything else you didn't like or, uh, what's the time looking like? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I mean, looking at the scores that this film has so far, uh, critics and audience wise, you know, it's somebody's enjoying it. Uh, yeah. You know, like I say, this may be another example of one of those things where I just missed the mark here. Maybe it's just not for me, but, uh, I don't know. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get what you're saying. Like, I like, yeah, you're right. They're, they're obviously people are out there enjoying it, and you know that's great. More power to you. Like, film is is a subjective art, and you know what one person deems as a great film, another deems as a pile of trash. And I'm not saying this film is a pile of trash. It's it's not. Uh, it's it's somewhere in in that low end low tier for me of Marvel films. It is right there down like with what we were talking about before. It's on that bottom tier with your Thor the Dark World, with your Iron Man 2s, all those really, you know, Eternals. Even though I like Eternals more than most people, um, it's still that bottom rung of, of Marvel and like it's one of those films I think is people are going to have forgotten about in six months, you know. Right. And it, I don't, I, I just think it, it missed the mark for me. And like I said before, it, do, it doesn't acknowledge anything that happened in Secret Invasion, which I understand for, for lots of reasons why you don't want to be associated with Secret Invasion because that was a, you know, that was a fucking mess in its own right. But yeah. overall, it just missed the mark for me. Um, so let's move on to, to final thoughts and, and, and review scores here, Todd. So we rank films on a scale of one to 10, uh, starting from one, the ranks are torture, two is awful, 
Three is bad. Four is subpar. Five is mediocre. Six is decent. Seven good. Eight great. Nine amazing. Ten masterpiece. So, Todd, give us your final thoughts and review score for the Marvels. I actually did think of one more good thing I have to say. Well, about too this. late. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, if if somehow out of all this, uh, you know, especially from what we see in that uh, mid credit scene, we finally get the MCU X Men proper, it will have been worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, I agree. Like, I mean, you know, obviously the X Men, everybody's been kind of anticipating when are they going to come into the MCU at, as uh, with the Fantastic Four since Marvel kind of reacquired those rights. Um, you know, I'm interested to see what they do if if reports and rumors are true that if Secret Wars is kind of going to reset the 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 status quo and kind of take everything back to formula, like we're saying. Like, are we gonna are we gonna see are we gonna see X Men proper? Or are we just gonna see like kind of alternate variants? And then once we reset, the mutants are kind of in the world, which I think probably is what you should do. Right. Just have just give us enough. Of what we remember, give us some of those member berries because you know we know <laughs> Hugh Jackman's coming back. Obviously, Kelsey Grammer's back. We don't know if that's specifically the Fox X Men. We don't know if we don't we don't know that again. He looks different, so he could be a variant. It, they could say he's the same. We don't know, but just give give me enough of that. Give me some X Men. Give me a little bit of uh, you know uh, wish fulfillment there in terms of like what I want from the X Men. But I think. Once you reboot it, then I think that's when you give, like, you know, you go back and mutants are just part of it, and you start X-Men proper from there, I think, is what you should do. But I guess we'll see how we handle it, and that's one of the biggest uh, the things I'm most interested to see is how they handle not only what they do with Fantastic Four, if everything is going to be rebooted soon within, you know, the next three years, how they handle the X-Men, what that looks like over the next, you know, few films. Uh, but anyway... All right, let's score this baby and go to the house. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, thinking back on the MCU, uh, being as I, I've mentioned a few times on our podcast, I'm at heart a DC fan. Uh, I'm not one of those hardliners. If you ask me, I'll say, hey, I love both, but DC is where my heart's at. Right. Uh, and through all the struggles with the DCEU and now getting ready to go into the DCU. At uh, some point. At some point. Uh one of the things I always kind of had to look back on or, or hang my hat on was the Marvel Cinematic Universe, believe it or not. Yeah. They always turned out good product. I never went into one of those movies like, man, this is going to be an utter shit show. Mm -hmm. I knew it may be of different varying quality, but yeah. it was always going to be worth my time and my money. And yeah. uh, that ain't true so much anymore, folks. Uh my score for this movie is probably the lowest I've scored anything since we've been doing towel capes. This is a three for me, mm. which is bad. Mm. Uh, there's far, far too little good things in this movie to pull it up for me score-wise. Uh, like I say, it's got decent scores right now, critically and audience. Uh, if you're liking it and if you're loving it, more power to you. Uh, maybe it just missed me like some things do, but it's a three for me. Gotcha. Uh, so for me, uh, the Marvels is admittedly a film whose primary audience probably isn't cynical 33-year-olds like me, uh, and that's okay, but uh, I have to review the film as the, the cynical 33-year-old man that I am. Uh, the first half of the film was boring until we reach Aladna, and the scenes on Aladna had me laughing my ass off, but to be clear, I wasn't laughing with the movie, I was laughing at it. Uh, I was laughing at how far the MCU has fallen, honestly. Uh, the gender of this film's leads are irrelevant to me. What matters is character and story. The story here is the typical villain of the week formula that, that permeates the genre. As for the characters, this film gets a few characters right, but just as many completely wrong. This could have cost $100 million less and have been a Disney Plus miniseries you know, to me. Uh, so at the end of the day, I give the Marvels a 4 out of 10, which ranks it as subpar. I couldn't go with a three. I struggled. I couldn't go with a three because I gave The Flash a three. And to me, I would rather watch this than The Flash. Really? I, I will. Yeah. I I hate The Flash. Okay. Everything about The Flash. I Yeah. If, you, if you're putting a gun to my head of which I would rather watch again, I would rather watch this. I guess. What about just the Keaton parts of The Flash or this? I'm just oh, kidding. Oh, I would watch the Keaton parts of The kidding. Flash. I'm just kidding. Go ahead, If man. I could just skip everything <laughs> else but 
the the Keaton parts of the Flash versus this. Yeah, I'll take the Keaton parts. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll be done mess- in fifteen minutes. <laughs> I'm and just messing with you. On with my day. Yeah, I couldn't go as low as I went the Flash. I really dislike the Flash. And again, uh, I'm with you. I was kind of you know DC is where I love both, and it's, it's not there's not a hard line for me about well, fuck Marvel. I love DC. Fuck DC. I love Marvel. Like I there's room in my heart to enjoy both, and I do. Um, I've always come down a little bit more on the the DC side. It's kind of what got me in. Um, but yeah, I just couldn't go as low as what I get the flash. Cause I hate the flash. <laughs> uh, all right, Todd. So tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media. Uh, you can find us at Tao Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tao Capes podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at towcapespod at gmail.com. Also, if you're so obliged, leaving us a five star review on your podcast app of choice really helps the show. Be on the lookout for this week's Popcorn Mumbles, where we'll be talking about the 2014 film The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 and 2015's Mockingjay Part 2. Tile Capes will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. See ya.